Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci-Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today, we're here with Chelsea Weiskerger. Chelsea, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Yeah, Chelsea. I'm Chelsea also, and I am a third-year PhD student here at MSU. I am in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, and uh, I do a lot of work with water quality at Great Lakes Beaches, specifically in the Chicago area of Lake Michigan. That's really interesting. Is there any other beaches that you also study in your research? Uh, Yeah, funny you should mention that. So uh, most of my work is confined to the Chicago area in northwest Indiana, Um, but I have also done some work in Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore up in the northern part of uh, the Lower Peninsula here. And I've done a little bit of uh, computer statistical work, so no field work, but some computer work on Lake Erie as well. So a little bit kind of all over the place, but my main focus is that sort of urbanized Chicago area. Do you travel to the area or do they send the samples over here? Usually I travel out to the area, um, which is one of my favorite parts of the job. I get to go out and walk the beach and collect samples and, uh, and then get to be out in the, um, in the laboratory as well. So that involves not being right in the middle of Michigan where we don't have a lot of beaches. So um, I enjoy getting out there and doing some of that field work too. So. so with these samples, what are you trying to look at? Well, most of the time we're looking at monitoring the water quality because the water can make people sick. Um, And so when people go out to the beach, when they're in contact with the water, they're in contact with a whole bunch of different microorganisms, things like E. coli and salmonella and um, all sorts of fun bugs like that. So, uh, So we do a lot of monitoring work to make sure that the beach water is safe enough for people to be to be out there and not have a reasonable chance of not getting sick when they go to the beach. Um, So a lot of times what we do is we go out and we take little samples of the water, usually like mm, 500 milliliters um, of water from each of the beaches that we go and look at, and we bring them back to the laboratory, and we analyze them for E. coli concentration. And we use E. coli because it's not necessarily pathogenic. It can't, uh, it can't always make us sick specifically, but usually when we see a lot of E. coli in the water, there's a good chance that there are a lot of other more dangerous microorganisms as well. So we look at the E. coli to kind of determine the overall water quality and safety of the water at the beach for, for people. Is there a particular reason why you look at biological material rather than chemical material in the water? Well, a lot of people actually, some other, other researchers do look at chemical material in the water. We look at biological material because it's, um, it's more likely to actually cause disease um, for, for a lot of the beachgoers. So the biological material is the, the types of um, organisms that can give us a stomach ache or make us have a skin rash or an ear infection. Um, and sometimes they even give us a respiratory infection as well. So um, in terms of public health, which is what I'm specifically concerned with and a lot of researchers like myself are concerned with, those biological contaminants are more of a focus than the chemical contaminants that can cause more sort of down-the-line type problems. So what happens whenever there is a biological contaminant? How do you clean that up in a large, well, literally a great lake since it's so big? Actually, you kind of just answered the question yourself, too. Because the lake is really big, a lot of times we can just let it go and close the beach and just tell people not to go not to go to the beach for a day or two um, and continue to sample. And over time, that biological contaminant actually ends up either settling out of the water So like sinking down to the bottom and out of the water where it's not really a much of an issue anymore or it gets diluted because it's in so much water. Um, And so then it ends up being a concentration that's low enough that is safe for people as well. So a lot of times it just takes a little bit of time and um, we just have to keep keep people away from the beach for for however long it takes to get that concentration down to a safe level again. So this might sound like a bit of a dirty question. But how often do you come across poop in the water? 
Uh, that's not a dirty question at all because I see poop in the water pretty much all the time. So what we look at when we go to the beach, of course, it's a natural area. So we've got people at the beach, but we also have a lot of wildlife, a lot of birds and you know raccoons and all that fun stuff that comes out at night that we don't usually get to see. Uh, but all of these things are using the beach um, even if we don't see them. And so they're pooping on the beach. And a lot of times once we get up in the morning and go sample again, we see the little remnants of them in the form of poops along the beach and uh, occasionally in the water as well. So I would say that I see poop on the beach more often than not. Do you think that's the main cause for the contamination? There are several causes of contamination at the beach. Uh, that is that is a main cause uh, as far as we know so far. Of course, the research is still kind of active and we're not 100% sure yet. But like I said, we have so many different sources of living things, people, wildlife, birds. So there's a, all of those things are creating the poop. And uh, the, the E. coli that we look at is by its own nature a fecal microorganism, which means it's associated with poop. So yeah, that does seem to be the major source as far as we know so far. The reason why I ask is because coming from Miami, it felt like once every season, they would always have to close off the beach because there was abnormal amounts of poop in the water. It was because a lot of times there was a lot of drain off into the ocean. And it just blows my mind that people are constantly swimming with poop and they don't really realize it. Yeah, it's funny that you should mention that because my my. My dad and I always kind of joke, he comes out to the lake and he always wants to go swimming. And I'm like, okay, you go ahead because I know what's in the water. (laughs) Um, But of course, the water is safe to go in. I don't want to tell people that it's not safe to go in. I just, uh, I see all of the poop that they don't see too. I guess, yeah, we should definitely (laughs) make sure that disclaimer is clear. It's really funny that you say that because I'm always telling Danny that I prefer to go to the beach than into the lake, not only because of the temperature, but because I always think that the ocean is cleaner. Like, do you think the ocean is cleaner or the lake is cleaner? That's a tough question. Uh, I think that they're both pretty, I mean, they, they can both be pretty contaminated. I've seen marine beaches and freshwater lake beaches have been closed and... There's just a huge variety over time and across different beaches. So I can't for sure say that ocean water is cleaner than lake water um, or vice versa. And they're also contaminated by different things, too. Like we test for E. coli in fresh water here and in the ocean they test for a different fecal contaminant called enterococcus. And so we're looking at different things and so we're obviously course seeing different things because they're different environments uh, generally speaking they'll have different contaminants too so I'm not sure if that answers the question but uh, in a lot of ways they're really because their environments are so different they're not necessarily comparable to say which one's more contaminated than the other. You had mentioned how different regions could have different contaminants, which makes sense, and how you look mainly at the Chicago region, but you've looked at other areas, such as Sleeping Bear. Chicago's more populated, and Sleeping Bear, well, I would guess is less populated, but they still have people that visit over there. What differences did you see with those areas? Well, there's actually a pretty big difference between the, the southern side of Lake Michigan in Chicago and Sleeping Bear Dunes. Just Uh, because of where they're located on the lake, as well as the different sort of populations that surround those beaches. So in Chicago, like you said, it's more urbanized. There are a lot more people and a lot more sources of contamination at the beaches than you might see up in uh, northern Michigan, up in Sleeping Bear Dunes. But Sleeping Bear Dunes is also situated up up at the top of the lake. And because of the circulation patterns, the way that the water moves in the lake, a lot of the water actually takes contaminants and moves them down toward the southern part of the lake. So it moves them away from Sleeping Bear Dunes and toward more of like the northwest Indiana and Chicago region. So just simply because of the physics of the lake and the way the water moves, we see a little bit less contamination Um, up in Sleeping Bear Dunes compared to Chicago as well. That effect is sort of compounded by the urbanization and all of the people that are in Chicago also. I'm not sure if we actually answered this question, but for any of our listeners tuning in now, 
what is your research question and what are you trying to solve with your research? Well, that's a good question. Um, and it's a question that I'm actually still kind of trying to nail down in my PhD program. Um, so I've always been somebody who likes to have a broad set of experiences. And that's great for getting all sorts of fun fun things and, uh, and a lot of expertise, but it's it makes nailing down a single question for thing for something like a PhD dissertation really tough. So what I am leaning toward right now is looking at the impacts of rivers actually on the lake and how they're um, how they're when they flow into the lake and when we have heavy storm events that send a lot of contaminants in the river out to the lake what sorts of time scales we're looking at as far as how far or how long after a storm event we might be able to expect the beaches to see some of those contaminants that were in the river. And we're also trying to use some computer modeling to do this. And we're also trying to look at sort of the spatial scales as well in terms of like I mentioned before, when the contaminants reach the beach, they might be very concentrated, but when they are out in the water, they dilute themselves over time uh, within all of the water. And so I can use my research to look at sort of the spatial scale and how, how far along the shoreline we can expect the beaches to be affected by these contaminants before they get diluted out in the water. Would you be looking at this with the Chicago River? Yes. Actually, that's one of the rivers that I'm looking at in my dissertation because the Chicago River is a very interesting river, it usually flows away from the away from Lake Michigan. But during heavy storm events, they actually have a uh, like a lock and dam type system that moves the water back through the river and into the lake, um, so that it doesn't flood Chicago and other places downstream. And so this is an interesting research question that we're trying to look at: is how do these sort of uh, quote unquote flow reversals, as they call them in the field, um, where they send the water back out into the lake. How do these impact the beaches and the nearby shoreline um, over time and sort of across space in Chicago? I wonder how the green dye affects the lake health every St. Patrick's Day. Is that something you've ever been curious about? Absolutely. I always see the pictures of it like on online and um, in the news stories and everything. And it looks so awesome. But uh, back in the back of my head, the environmental engineer in me is like, mm, like, that can't be good for the water. That can't be good for the ecosystem. What's going to happen downstream? And how is that sort of, or how is that green dye maybe interacting with some of the other contaminants in the river too, in ways that we can't even imagine? So, um yeah, I always kind of uh, shudder a little bit when I see the green dye, even though it looks really cool. You had mentioned that you guys do some computational modeling. Is that what you guys do in the winter when it's basically frozen on the shoreline? Actually, my lab does it pretty much all year. So when I'm lucky enough to get out to the shoreline, that's fantastic. But we usually collect that type of uh, water quality data in order to calibrate our models and make sure that they're predicting effectively. And so we don't need to be out in the field all of the time. So when we're not out there, we're stuck in the computer lab. I guess I shouldn't say stuck, but we are in the computer lab working on these models and trying to develop ways to better simulate how the water moves within the lake and what that means for contaminant movement too. Do you see differences in the way that contaminants move through the lake whenever it's summer versus winter time? Well, we, we actually don't model in the winter because a lot of times the lake is frozen. Um, so it's really, really hard to track like how the water is moving underneath the ice. Um, that's something that I, from the beginning of my graduate program, have been interested in. And I've always talked to my advisor and he says, we can't really look at that because of the ice on the lake. So it is an interesting question. And I think if we can get a model that can simulate it, it would be an interesting question. Uh, research question to look at and see uh, exactly what goes on in the non, non-swimming non season in Lake Michigan. So no one samples the ice to for analysis because technically it'll just melt into water by the time you're home. That's a fantastic point and that's a point that I have made before too. Um, 
But no, we actually, when we monitor, we monitor just during the swimming season, which is usually between uh, Memorial Day and Labor Day. And so, and the reason why we do that is because that's when people are most likely to be out at the beach. And because we're monitoring for public health, that's uh, that's what we have to kind of stick to um, is that time frame of the swimming season. Thanks for sharing that with us today, Chelsea. I've heard about other organizations that are on campus regarding water research and things like that. Are you involved with any of those organizations? Well, MSU is actually a really good water research university um, because we have so many great researchers here in the Fisheries and Wildlife Department as well as the Environmental Engineering uh, group here on campus. So there's a lot of really good research being done. Um, as far as what I'm involved in, my research is more in the interest of public health, the way that I see it. So I'm really involved in a group on campus that uh, that organizes what we call the One Health Initiative, which basically suggests that environmental health, human health, and animal health are all pretty Um, inextricably linked. And so if we want to make sure that the environment is safe and healthy, uh, we also have to look into the the animals in the environment and how we interact with the environment as well. And so that's been something that I've been a really big part of in the last couple of years or so uh, in terms of organizing things and making sure that One Health is an idea throughout campus and that people are aware of what's going on with One Health um, and how it relates to their own activities and research and studies here at MSU. What has been your involvement with One Health? So I started out with One Health um, because I had a friend who told me that I should do it. And I was like, okay, great. This sounds like right up my alley. Um, And so I initially started with what we call the One Health Student Challenge, which is a collaborative effort between the University of Saskatchewan in Canada and MSU here. And what it does is it brings groups of interdisciplinary um, undergrads together. And uh, we have different teams that represent a whole range of different areas of study. And they come together and they work on problems uh, related to One Health. For instance, we've worked on water scarcity before, and we've also worked on antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Um, And these groups get together, and over the course of about six weeks or so, they develop management plans and, and sort of practical solutions for these One Health challenges. And then they kind of present, and it's, of course, a competition, which is always fun for the undergrads as well. But I, uh, my role within this One Health Student Challenge was to be a graduate facilitator, which basically had me mentoring one of these undergraduate groups. And uh, so I was kind of making sure that they were on the right track, making sure that they were thinking about things and, uh, and kind of bringing everything back to the the sort of overall One Health perspective that we needed to be focusing on. That's really cool. What do you feel like you learned from that mentoring experience? Mentoring is a very different experience than sort of the independent research that I had been used to. Um, So I felt like I gained a lot and I learned a whole bunch just from my group that I was mentoring. I feel like they taught me more than I taught them, especially about things like working together and effectively communicating with each other throughout the process. Uh, So I had a I had a fantastic time. I feel like I got a lot out of it, and I certainly hope that I was able to sort of impart some knowledge to my group as well. It's really great to have an interest in sharing your knowledge with the public and getting people informed about the importance of water quality. How do you plan on using that in your future careers? When I have been into the field, um, I always do try to communicate and and talk to the people that are at the beach and see sort of where they're at. And what I've noticed is a lot of times the people at the beach don't really have any idea about what's going on. And they're always really, really interested in what I'm doing and why I'm at the beach, too. But when I tell them that we're looking at water quality, they all of a sudden get really, really scared, like, oh, should I not be here? And and it really kind of shows me that there is that sort of disconnect between the science that's going on and, and what we know here in 
academia and in, in the research world and what those people who actually use the beach uh, know about in terms of uh, safety and water quality. And so, yeah, it's really important to me to sort of help bridge that gap and make sure that people are aware of what's going on in the beach, but not to the point of like being scared of the beach as well. So I obviously I don't want to discourage people from going to the beach because it is really fun and it's a great way to enjoy a summer day. But we do need to be aware of some of the risks that are involved when we go out there. So so that is a big part of what I would like to do once I graduate from MSU here. I'd like to be involved um, with communicating beach beach health and, and water quality issues to people in addition to continuing on with the research that I'm doing here. There are different opportunities here at Michigan State University for you to get involved with science policy. Are there any organizations or initiatives that you've taken for this career that you'd like to partake in in the future? As a matter of fact, yes. Um, So here at MSU, we do have the option for graduate students to undergo a dual PhD program in the Environmental Science and Policy program here or as we like to call it, ESPP. So uh, this is a program that, again, is really, really interdisciplinary, and it brings people from all different colleges across campus together to study environmental issues. And so within the program, we have to take a number of courses together, and there a lot of times they're team-based courses. So we end up working in interdisciplinary groups which is designed to help us figure out how to communicate issues and communicate the way that we do research to each other, which is really, really um, important as we head out into the world, especially if we're looking at, again, communication of our science, but also influencing policy, because we can't go up and and just give policymakers a whole bunch of numbers and statistics and charts and, and say, you should do this. So, ESPP is really training us in how to effectively communicate our science across disciplines so that we can be more efficient um, at influencing the policy that we all care so much about. That's incredible, Chelsea. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. (laughs) Thanks, Chelsea. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about my research. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember... The truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on SciFiles.